Every time my Pokemon level up, they evolve into something completely random. It could be a legendary powerhouse, or literal trash. And to make things even harder, I'll be playing with hardcore Nuzlocke rules, so any Pokemon that faints is dead forever, and if my whole team wipes out, I'll have to start all over again. Trainer Pokemon are also randomized, so there's a lot that can go wrong. Could I beat it? Let's find out. To start, we meet our new friends, and I made a pretty good first impression with my nickname. Let me know in the comments below who your favorite Gen 6 starter is, but I'm taking Chespin because of his adorable little red nose and polite smile. After tackling Shauna's Chikorita into oblivion, our Chespin leveled up and randomly evolved into something much less cute. The professor gives us a note for our mum, and I wonder what it says. Probably something elegant and romantic. Like video and subscribe to Keegan J, please. Love, Sycamore. Wow, what lovely handwriting. On Route 2, I caught a Pidgey named Kramer, and our Ghastly leveled up. I've randomized the game so that trainers' teams will change into random Pokemon with similar stats. This means that the early game is a little easier, but it makes the late game way harder. With that in mind, I cruised through the first few routes, catching some extra Pokemon along the way before reaching Santa Loon City. <laughs> I love his little dance moves. And after leveling up our team, we were ready for the first gym. Viola leads with an Encarta, which isn't amazing for my Hoppip, so I switch into Granbull to land an Intimidate before taking Encarta down by blowing a few bubbles. Next up is Minin, but after nerfing it with some charms, I can switch into Grimer and finish things off with a barrage of water pulses. So badge one was pretty easy. In Lumio City, half the town is completely blocked off due to a blackout. Yep. Completely blocked. Absolutely no one is allowed to enter. We confront the certified Gen 1-er, Sycamore, but my Avalog tears him to shreds with a string of fury cutters. I steal his Bulbasaur as reparations for trying to seduce our mum with his love letters. Sycamore sends us on a mission to research Mega Evolution, which he can't do because apparently he has to deliver a big French baguette to our mum. That's weird. I didn't know that he was a baker. Our team was looking pretty average, but on the next route, we got some huge upgrades. This made the battles here pretty easy, and after struggling for way too long with a children's puzzle, we make our way to Silage City while catching a ton of new Pokemon along the way. It's important to catch as many Pokemon as possible, as more Pokemon gives me a higher chance of having six decent Pokemon at any given time. Before long, I'd leveled up our team and we were up against Grant, chasing our second badge. My plan is to lead with Hitmontop for an early Intimidate. Side note, how is this thing intimidating? It's a Beyblade with legs. Anyway, Grant leading with Yanma isn't a great matchup for me, so I immediately switch out into Joey. Grant tries to get really cheesy by confusing Joey and setting up double team, but I got lucky and landed a Leech Seed through the cheese on my very first try. I want to keep Joey safe since Leech Seed is really valuable, so switch into Need Arena and finish Yanma off with Acrobatics. Turns out that Grant is now a bug catcher, with his second Pokemon being Beautifly. He helplessly stalls for a few turns with Morning Sun, but resistance is futile. Eventually, I land a critical hit Acrobatics, squashing Grant's bugs and securing our second badge. We had some wacky evolutions on the next route, including a Lotad who evolved straight into a Ludicolo. He never got to experience the joys of being a teenager. A Team Flare grunt says they're going to use some rocks to build something that makes them happy. It sounds like an adorable arts and crafts session. I can't wait to see what inspiring things they build. The next fight really scares me. We have to battle Karina, who has two randomized Pokemon that will be as strong as Lucario. Although, our new Ludicolo is a tank, setting up Leech Seed and using Protect to help grind down Slowking. Her next Pokemon is a Speed Boost Blaziken, but Ludicolo is just the man for the job, taking it down with Bubble Beam. We made it through that fight unscathed, but it gives you a taste of how stacked the late game randomized teams could be. Now I see why Lucario likes you so much. Uh, what are you talking about? I didn't see any Lucario. After a short trip through the Reflection Cave, we arrive in Shallow City, where Tiano reminds me of the nickname I picked. We head to the Tower of Mastery, and once inside we- Oh my god! Instead of a receding hairline, this man's hair just migrated south for the winter and merged with his eyebrows. While getting ready for the next gym, I had a pretty crazy string of evolutions and our team for the next gym was looking filthy. Our Joey, who had once again become a Lombre, managed to make quick work of Karina's Need Arena. Her Scrafty is much deadlier though, bringing Lombre to low health with a high jump kick. But by switching into the ghost type, Hooper, we guarantee that the next high jump kick doesn't connect, causing it to take itself out. Huh, idiot. Karina's last Pokemon is a pretty useless Corsola, so a few Dragon Breaths take it out, giving us Badge 3. Now, you might think that beating Karina twice would be enough. Wrong. 
we've got to beat Karina for a third time. For this one, we're given a Mega Lucario who stomps all over her Delphox. And on the next route, we're also given a Lapras before riding our noble steed all the way to Kumarine City. We can take on the next gym pretty much straight away. Now, I would make fun of Ramos's beard, but it's probably not a good idea to mock someone with a huge pair of scissors that could easily cut me in half. Ah, what the hell. <laughs> I was hoping to tear through this fight with Mega Lucario. We won't be able to use the Mega Stone once it randomly evolves, so this is our only chance to use it. But after setting up a Swords Dance, Slowbro got the confusion with Water Pulse. Not wanting to risk hitting myself, I had to switch and pivoted into our Lapras. I beat down Slowbro with a bunch of Body Slams, and just as Ramos is about to heal, I bring Joey the Unpheasant out and set up a Leech Seed. Ramos ends up burning another Hyper Potion, but just as Slowbro is about to fall, I bring Lucario back in to finish Slowbro with a power-up punch. Having seen how I just destroyed his Slowbro, Ramos changes up his strategy and sends in another Slowbro. Are you kidding me? It's another bad matchup for Lucario, so I end up using the same strategy as the first Slowbro, taking it down with some body slams from Lapras. Ramos' last Pokemon is the Prinplup, but this is where I use a new busted strategy. The move Perish Song causes all Pokemon on the field to faint in three turns. The AI will usually switch out before this happens, but if the enemy is on their last Pokemon, then we can guarantee the KO by stalling for three turns. With that, Prinplup goes down. Now we had four badges, halfway there, and the run has been really smooth so far, although there was a lot of carnage ahead, and the randomizer would only get harder as the game went on. They're gonna light the tower. Let's go see it, daddy. <sighs> what have I become? The gym puzzle has us play who's that Pokemon, and as someone whose full-time job is Pokemon, surely I would nail this, right? Okay, unironically, I don't remember which one that is. Is that the grass one? Uh, that's Pansage if I've ever seen it. My Pokemon knowledge is unmatched. I'm literally a professional Pokemon player, and I'm saying that's Pansage. I know this one. Give it to me, Pansage! Fuck! Anyway, the gym leader here is a small kid with an Inspector Gadget complex, so let's take his lunch money. I lead with our MVP, Kramer, and immediately set up two layers of Toxic Spikes. This will badly poison grounded Pokemon on entry, and it'll be a huge part of my strategy going forward. Once Kramer is in crit range, we switch into Claydol, who gets Fero Low a few times, burning Clement's Hyper Potions. This Claydol also has the move Recover, which helps to keep me healthy. And with my last Ancient Power, Firo is shot out of the sky. Next up is Glalie, and this is a problem because my team is really weak to ice. Offensively, I can't do much, but thanks to the toxic spikes, I can focus on stalling with recover while Glalie slowly succumbs to the poison. My Claydol is frozen in the process, but Rapidash can be handled by switching into Lugia and surfing all over it. With five badges, I was feeling pretty good. I'd played pretty safe for the most part, but that's about to change because as I got my next encounter, I was about to do something very dumb. All right, Carablast. Not really big money, but uh, I'll take all the encounters I can get. That was a crit. That's the best you can do, Carablast, really. Oh, we've got... In I forgot we had Intimidate on this. Ah, uh, that's going to hurt. Ow! Oh, no! Joey! Uh... God damn it. My first death, and it was to a damn Carablast. I caught it, and in honor of our fallen Joey, I named it Joey 2. Losing Joey was a huge loss because that was our Leech Seed user. But after making a dumb mistake, surely I'd be more careful from now on. Nothing but big brain plays from here on, right? Like the plot of an awful horror movie, we find a spooky house, and the obvious decision is to break in? An old man tells us probably the worst story I've ever heard. Well, besides the Sword and Shield plot, at least. Lavare City to the north is our next stop, and it's here that we find the next gym. A trainer here had a Caesar, which is a really scary Pokemon, and I was only able to deal with it thanks to Perish Song. The run was definitely getting harder. Really? Another person wearing wings? This region has some certified weirdos. My team for this fight was a total mixed bag. I led with Kramer the Crocodile, and Valerie countered with a mini Crocodile. As is tradition, I went for my usual Toxic Spikes opening, which went up without any issues. But since I was confused in the process, I pivoted into my Howl Lucha. I was able to do decent damage with Headbutt, but was confused by Swagger and hit myself, which hurts a lot. I must have hit my head too, because this is where my brain disappeared. Pretty much have to switch now, right? I don't think I can stay in, which is really annoying. Although what I can do, if I go into Fran. Oh wait, no, that was really bad. What am I doing? It's got crunch. I just remembered. 
Why am I throwing? On the plus side, I could now bring Howlucha back in and finish Crocorock with one more headbutt. Valerie's last two Pokemon were handled by stalling out the Toxic, but losing another Pokemon in such a dumb way was not ideal. To make matters worse, the Pokemon we lost was our Perish Song user, which means our team just got a lot worse. So I needed to rebuild, bring in new team members, and upgrade their movesets. In the Pokeball Factory, we come across Team Flare, who look like they've been plucked straight out of the Zoolander universe. But this section is a little scary, as we team up with Serena for a double battle. If they double up into my Pokemon, I could easily lose someone. But instead, they ganged up on Serena, so we took care of Team Flare without any more losses. On the next routes, we were able to catch a few extra Pokemon, and the run was definitely starting to ramp up. We were beginning to face stronger, final stage Pokemon way more often. In Dendermill Town, we meet up with Professor Sycamore, so I guess that baguette delivery went well. Good for him. It's important to forget things from time to time. What kind of deep-seated trauma are you trying to forget? Sycamore mentions that the legendary Pokemon of the region resembles the letter Y. My god, I know that Pokemon. Before we go on, I'll have to clear the Frost Cavern, and it's almost impressive how I managed to hit every optional trainer here. I nearly paid the price when this Lapras got a crit and almost took out Monica the Dusknaw. There's also a treacherous double battle here, and I had to risk the chance of being crit or doubled into, but luckily, I was able to make it out safe. The Team Flare battles here have some powerful Pokemon, like Caesar and Miss Magius, but we have a Scavalier, an absolute beast who handles things all on its own. Now we can go through Route 17, riding on the back of Mamoswine, who's just suffocating under the snow. Anyway, here I catch a Delibird and name it Carlton. That's important. Remember that. At the end of the route, Hologram Serena challenges us to a rematch, and since our last battles with her have all been pretty easy, this one should be no different. Boy, was I wrong. I prepared for the fight and got some pretty good evolutions. With Palkia on the team, I felt pretty confident and was ready to sweep Serena. She leads with a Luminion, which I take out pretty quickly with a few Thunderbolts. Although her next Pokemon is a problem, Haxorus. I don't have any hard counters to it in the back, so stay in with Palkia and try to land an Ice Fang. But then this happened. Oh no, it has dragon coverage. Ow! That hurts so much. This puts me in a really tough spot. I do have Frostlass, but it doesn't have any ice moves, and my team is pretty limited. To make matters worse, my Dusknaw is Carlton, our Deli Bird from earlier, and I forgot to teach it any new moves. Which means, not only have we lost Palkia, but our Dusknaw only knows the move present. This was looking really rough, and we could wipe right here. Without any great options, I went into Raymond the Marowak to set up Leech Seed, which we do, but Hydreigon sets up a workup in the process, and at this point, I'm preparing to get swept. To try and stall, I switch into Carlton, which ends up being free since I'm not affected by Slam. Dusknaw barely survives a Dragon Rush. Throwing caution to the wind, I channel my heart of the cards and use present. But this ends up healing Hydreigon instead. At this point, I just let Carlton die out of sheer disappointment. Next, I bring in Frostlass and stall for a turn with Protect. In response, Hydreigon just spits in my face and uses the turn to boost its stats even more. It's now or never, so I go for a Bug Buzz which does big damage. Here's where my luck turned around, because Hydreigon got greedy and used another bulk up. We probably would have wiped here if it attacked, but with that twist, one more Bug Buzz finally took down the Demonic Dragon. We were still at DEFCON 1, because Serena has half her team left and we're not in good shape. The incoming Lunatone is an awful matchup for Frostlass, so I Volt Switch out of there and reintroduce Marowak. After setting up Leech Seed, I switch into Chimeco, fully prepared to sacrifice it. But Lunatone started using some status moves, which let me stall out the Leech Seed damage. Serena's last Pokemon is Levani, which is perfect for me because I can switch into Kramer, who is now a Pyroar, and with one 4 times Acrobatics, Levani goes down and we somehow avoided what felt like certain death. That was so close, and this was a real wake-up call that I needed to be way more prepared going forward. So I leveled up every Pokemon, not just the ones in our party, but the PC too. This gave me way more options for team building, so I was able to put together a pretty good roster for the next gym. After navigating through the absolute trip fest of this gym, we're faced by Olympia. She leads with a double scoop ice cream, and I go with Kramer, quickly setting up two layers of toxic spikes. A crunch does barely any damage, and an ice beam puts Pyro in crit range. This is a dangerous situation, because three of my team members are weak to ice. I sent out 
Articuno to begin chipping away with Dragon Breath, but it turns out that Vanillux also has Mirror Shot, which Articuno is weak to as well. I eventually do get Vanillux to low HP, but Olympia heals, and after taking a big critical hit, Articuno just hangs on with 8 HP. Switching into Kingdra was my best bet, until I got hit with Ice Beam on the Switch. A Surf gets Vanillux to low HP once more, but Olympia heals again. With our team so battered and no great options, I made the tough decision to sacrifice our Kingdra. I thought that a close combat from Kramer would surely finish Vanillux, but completely forgot about the rivalry ability. This could have cost me my favorite Pokemon if the AI didn't spend the turn setting up Hail. So I got kinda lucky there, but it allowed me to finish Vanillux on the next turn. All that work just to get past Olympia's first Pokemon. I needed her last two Pokemon to be something that I can work with. And I definitely got my wish. Her Armaldo and Chimeco were both handled by Groudon without much trouble, giving me a smooth finish to what was a terrible start. Whew, seven badges down. Much like two Park, Lysander returns via hologram. He basically tells us his plan, which if you really think about it, he would have had no trouble pulling it off if he just kept his mouth shut. Like we were this close to the end of the world. For now, there are a lot of team flare battles here, but with a team like this, we really didn't have much trouble. We lost some good Pokemon, but gained some great ones too. Maybe our luck was turning around. Lysander just has this dude locked up in his basement, which is kinda kinky. I press the big red button to start the end of the world, and hey, maybe you should press the big red button too. Geosense Town just gets absolutely wrecked, and we head there to pursue Lysander. He starts crying when he sees how stacked my team is, and this battle is super smooth, with my legendaries doing a lot of the heavy lifting. After slapping a ton of grunts around with Serena, Shauna decides to finally be useful by uploading some malware into this door. There's six more flare grunts in here and three of us. So we divide the work up evenly and I end up taking on four of them. Our team is still really solid, so before long, the grunts were sent to the Shadow Realm and it was time to watch Yveltal's birth. Now, you might think that Yveltal would be hard to catch, but the CEO of the Pokeball Factory gave us something that makes this much easier. That's right, by throwing a big nugget square at Yveltal's face, we weaken it enough to catch it instantly. For once, I actually agree with Shauna when she asks Lysander what the hell is going on with your outfit. He's back for a third consecutive beatdown, and his team has gotten stronger, but we just caught Yveltal. Two Dark Pulses eradicate Golem, Trevenant gets blown away by an Oblivion Wing, as does Gorgeist, and as does Zorork. That was way easier than I thought, but we've been really lucky with how good our evolutions have been recently. I started thinking there wouldn't be any more deaths, but little did I know, there were a lot more deaths coming. Somehow, our Starmie knows fly, which makes me picture it just taking off like a helicopter. I backtracked to grab the leftovers, which will be a huge help in the late game. We catch a few new Pokemon on the next routes, before meeting up with our favorite Baker in Kuraway Town. He packs three powerful Pokemon, but my Zygarde has Calm Mind, as well as the leftovers, and protects to recover HP. This is a pretty busted combo, and after boosting my stats, we can solo Sycamore's team pretty easy. There's a few battles with our gang on the next route, but after taking care of business there, we reach Nobel City, the location of the final gym. And this one was going to be the bloodiest yet. At this point in the game, even the gym trainers were giving me trouble. This trainer has the Disco Buffalo, Bufalant, and it knows Megahorn, which only now did I realize pretty much my whole team is weak to bug. Big yikes. After considering my options, I decided to stay in with Houndoom and hope for the best. My team is going to get slapped around by Megahorn. I just need to damage it. If I at least damage it and we lose Phoebe, then I can finish it off probably with a shame in close combat. Burn? Burn? Oh, crit, nice. Do I live a thrash? No, a crit. Oh, damn it. At this range, a close combat from Shaman was enough to finish the job, but our losses were starting to add up and the game was only going to get harder from here. After big braining my way through the gym puzzle, I leveled up my team and stepped up to the final gym leader, Wolfric. Now, I was hoping to lead with Kramer the Pyroar and set up Toxic Spikes, but that was stopped very quickly because Wolfric led with a Herpowdon that knows Earthquake. Keeping Pyroar in wasn't an option, so I switched into Zapdos for free and put Herpowdon to sleep with Yawn. An Earth Power does about 40% damage and the recoil from Double Edge leaves Herpowdon at low HP. And then this happened. So now it's asleep and I can probably take it out with... A surf. The risk is if it wakes up on the first turn, uh, it could be kind of dicey, but I know I know that it won't go for Earthquake on this turn. That's an advantage. I'm going to go into Homer. Don't wake up. Stay asleep. Don't wake up. I can't stress this enough. Good, 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 good. Stay asleep. Keep sleeping. 
Oh, he just hung on. And he woke up? No. Oh! Damn it! That really sucked. Knowing that Wolfric would heal, I sent out Joey to the Kingdra and landed a Toxic. I don't have many offensive options for her pad on, so this means I had to take it out by stalling. With a few Protects and Dragon Pulses, we drained another of Wolfric's Hyper Potions before the monstrous Hippo finally went down. But our problems weren't over yet, because next is the Fairy-type Granbull. I had to get Kingdra out of there, so I made an important switch. At level 55, Granbull is going to have Payback, Play Rough, Rage, and Roar. So Play Rough is the obvious option for him to go for. And our options for dealing with it are really limited. Uh, I think I want to go into Monica here, try and get a Charm off, because uh, this Pokemon only uses physical moves. Play Rough, there it is. Survive. Oh my god, another crit. We'd had Monica for ages, so this death really hurt, and I was in an awful spot. Zapdos is low, Kingdra is weak to Fairy, and Pyroar has awful coverage for Granbull. This means that my only real option was to send in Deoxys, a powerful Pokemon who would surely pick up the KO, right? I'm definitely going to move first, so there's not much benefit to using Oblivion Wing, because I, I don't need the recovery, so I think I just go for Thunderbolt, because I have the extra damage and a chance to, to paralyze. Come on. Big money, big money, big money. That is nowhere near enough damage. That is nowhere near enough damage. And another death. It's hurting, it's hurting bad out here. Having lost half of my team, the focus was purely to survive. I went into Kramenext and set up two layers of toxic spikes because I don't know what that last Pokemon is, but at least this potentially gives me a way of dealing with it. Another reason for this is that in those two turns, Granball brings my health to below 50%, which activates my Citrus Berry and means that Acrobatics will now do more damage. But it's nowhere near enough, and our old friend Kramer had received his death sentence. It's not great, but it's our best shot. Come on, crit, crit, crit. No! Oh, Raw, okay. I'll take that. I'll take that. Okay, so the AI completely spared me by using Raw, which dragged out Zapdos for free. With one Earth Power, Grand Bull was put down. His last Pokemon is a Fion, which would be a lot scarier if I didn't have Toxic Spikes. It only knows water moves, which Kingdra tanks pretty well, and a few Dragon Pulses finished the job. That was brutal. Our team had been decimated. Wolfric only had three Pokemon and still gave us that much trouble. With Victory Road and the Pokemon League still to come, this challenge was really ramping up. I had to dig into our PC to build an entirely new team. The trainers in Victory Road are stacked, but I made sure to form a team with strong typings and plenty of pivot potential. So as we moved through Victory Road, I was able to handle the first few trainers very quickly with my heavyweight Machamp doing a ton of work. Although Machamp soon leveled up and the results were less than ideal. But with one more level up, we got a Blaziken, which I would love to save for the Pokemon League. I carefully dodged as many trainers as I could because all it takes is one bad random fight for us to get absolutely buried. But this clearing is where things get scary because we have our final match with Serena. And in case you've forgotten, our last battle with her did not go well. I lead with Kramer the Honchcrow and Serena goes for Alakazam, which is perfect for me. Alakazam doesn't have any moves that can damage a dark type, so Honchcrow is entirely free to set up two layers of toxic spikes. On the second turn, Serena does switch into Electabuzz. So expecting an electric move, I safely switch into my ground type Gastrodon and take Electabuzz down with a few surfs. Snorlax is up next, and this big boy is dangerous since it knows Belly Drum and Giga Impact. Pretty much everyone on my team would be dead to a crit, except for Clin Clang. A few play roughs and some toxic damage wear down Snorlax enough for the KO. Her pad on is next, which definitely sparks some PTSD. But this time, I have a much better plan. The AI wants to Earthquake Clin Clang, so I can switch for free into Honchcrow. And against Honchcrow, the AI wants to Double Edge, which Clin Clang can tank pretty well. This strategy stalls for time, while the toxic damage brings her pad on to the brink of death before one last acrobatics gives me some sweet, sweet revenge against the big hippo. The fight had been really smooth so far, but things were about to get worse. Curum is a demon, and I don't have any hard counters for it. I decided my best move was to switch into Joey to the Heatmore, who instantly got crit on entry. Although this pops my Citrus Berry for some recovery, and using Protect on the following turn helps me to store some extra poison damage. On the next turn, I decided to put my faith in Joey too, and then this happened. Hang in there, Joey too. You can do it. Believe. Oh, he's clutching up. He's going huge. That's our boy right there. Joey 2. He's doing it for Joey 1. Alright, now we protect. 
I think it's going to just hang on, though. But that's fine. That's fine. Come on, take it down. Boom! There it goes. All right, awesome. Serena's last Pokemon is Alakazam, who can't touch my Honchkrow, so it fell, and we'd gotten our revenge on Serena after a pretty stressful fight. After safely navigating the last few trainer battles of Victory Road, we had finally made it to the Pokemon League, and this would be by far the hardest part of the challenge. Up until now, if we had an awful Pokemon, we could replace it with something from the PC. But in the Pokemon League, when my Pokemon inevitably level up and randomly evolve, I won't be able to do that. Since I don't have access to the PC, whatever we get, we're stuck with. A few bad evolutions could very well end the run and send me back to the beginning. So we needed some luck, but I can't control that. What I can control is the Pokemon I take in with me and the moves I teach them. So I evolved a ton of Pokemon and upgraded their movesets to build the best team possible. I had a stacked roster, spearheaded by our Kramer, the Pidgey that we caught way back on Route 2, who was now a Meganium. But the team would look very different once I started to level up. For now, it was time to tackle the Elite Four. Their teams are randomized, so it doesn't really matter what order I take them on. I went after Wickstrom first and safely set up two layers of toxic spikes. Meganium was confused by a dynamic punch, but this is fine. Polyrath can't hit ghost types, so I safely switch into Golurk. The AI switches, but I expected this and went for U-turn to maintain momentum. This ended up working really well as Wickstrom sent in Abzol, who instantly fell to the poison damage after a super effective U-turn. Wickstrom sends in his Tauros next, which is another Pokemon that can't hit ghost types. So I tried to pull off the same strategy with Golurk, but was confused by Swagger this time. Not wanting to risk hitting myself, I just pivot between Golurk and Blaziken while the toxic damage builds up. Wickstrom heals up with a full restore, so I use this turn to U-turn into Alakazam, who outspeeds Tauros and cleans it up with Psychic. Wickstrom has a Meganium of his own, which is super passive. A U-turn lowers it to below half before a fire punch from Blaziken burns it to a crisp. Last is the returning Polyrath, who we know can't hit Golurk, so it's completely free to stall out. This fight ended up being pretty easy, but I didn't expect that battle to be too hard since we still have our full power team. But during the battle, Golurk leveled up, and now we were completely at the whims of RNG. All we can do is hope that it's something good. Please. Please. We need this is when we need good Pokemon the most. It is so important. Please, not something I can work with. Give it to me. Yes! Beautiful! Oh! I was so relieved because Caesar has an awesome defensive typing, and being able to use Leech Seed and U-Turn on it is amazing. So far, so good. Next in my sights was Drasna, who leads with a Carnivine. It does decent damage to Kramer, but not enough to stop me from setting up two layers of toxic spikes. I'm not in crit range yet, so stay in and fire off a few crunches. With Carnivine at low HP, a switch into Blaziken lets me finish it off with Fire Punch. Next is Gigalith, and it has one move that really worries me. Stone Edge, Sandstorm, and Stealth Rock. This thing has Explosion, uh, which really, really makes me want to go into Charlie, the Aegislash. Like, really bad. <laughs> I feel like it's going to Stone Edge. I'm going into Charlie. Please, boom. Explode. I dare you. I dare you to go boom. Boom! <laughs> Outplayed, nerd. Next up is Cradley, who immediately goes down to an Iron Head, but Drasna's last Pokemon was scary. A Cobalion? Oh, jeez, okay. The thing that's scary about Cobalion, uh, it doesn't get hit by Toxic Spikes. What's it going to have? At 65, it's going to have Work Up, Quick Guard, Swords Dance, and Sacred Sword, which means its only damaging move is Fighting Type, which can't hit me, which means it should be free. This Cobalion can't hit me. It can buff its stats all it likes, but it cannot touch me. Yeah, Ghost Types are awesome. I brought two of them to, to begin with, but now we're, gonna, we're probably going to have none. So enjoy it while it lasts. Boom, dead Cobalion. That's Drasna done. We'd beaten Drasna and still had all six Pokemon left. Although we were about to lose two of our best Pokemon. Completely random. So if they become something terrible, then our team gets severely weaker. Come on, Blaziken, please. Please, please, please. This is not the time for games. Don't mess around. Don't screw me. Don't screw me. Come on. Oh, no. A Chatot. Our new champion for the Elite Four is a Chatot. And we still have two Elite Four members and the champion to go, and our team has a Chatot on it. All right, Aegislash, don't do what do not do what Blaziken just did. Do something different. Be better. Please, I can't afford to have two bad Pokemon. I need this. 
Okay, jazz hands. All right. So now our team was much worse and we weren't even halfway through the Pokemon League. Next up was the Blazing Chamber where Malva resides. I've been able to get Toxic Spikes up in both battles so far, but this time I wasn't so lucky. Malva leads with a Glalie that knows sheer cold and I couldn't afford to risk Kramer. So I decided to switch into Simipaw. Do it for me. All right, Hail, that's fine. We take those. I just need to get rid of this Glalie, like ASAP. Bada bing. Oh, okay. It's a two shot. Oh, no, it hit the sheer cold. Charlie, no. My bad luck was getting worse. It hit the very first sheer cold. At this range, Palkia can get the revenge kill with Surf. Next up is Aurorus, who Palkia can also drown out. The Gliscor that follows is scary because it also has a one hit KO move with Guillotine. However, one more Surf from Palkia can take it down before RNG has the chance to screw me. Malva's last Pokemon ends up being Torkoal, so Palkia wraps things up with, you guessed it, another Surf. That's three members down, but we've taken some big blows, losing a Pokemon and being stuck with Chatot. Ugh. The last Elite Four member is Seabold, who leads with a very dangerous Barbarical. I do manage to get my Toxic Spikes up, but get crit on turn two, which means I have to switch. Our Caesar is the best option, with its high defense and good typing. I also taught it the move Roost between battles, so this keeps me healthy while I set up Leech Seed. After some stalling, a switch into Palkia lets me finish Barbarical with an Earth Power. Next up is a Kangaskhan, who I expect to go for Outrage. This means it's safe to bring in Caesar. By U-turning just before Seabolt heals, I can safely bring Palkia back in and take Kangaskhan down with two Surfs. Seabold sends out a Leafeon next, who I was hoping to KO with a U-turn, but just fell short. So as a sign of disrespect, I sent Chatot out and had him deliver the final blow with Fire Punch, despite Chatot not having any fists. Last up is a Ninetales, and I decided to keep Chatot on the front lines with the hope that it would get enough EXP to evolve. You can do it, Chatot. Kick! No, Chatot, why? I want Chatot to get the KO because it might level up and then evolve if it does. <laughs> Come on, Chatot. This is big. Chatot, he's going huge. He's going nuts. Chatot MVP. <laughs> oh, and he didn't level up though. Damn it. We defeated Seabold and only the champion remained, but we were about to lose our Palkia. Okay, so we lose our Palkia for the, for the champion, which is a huge L. But in return, what do we get? Come on, I, this is for the champion fight. I need something good. Please, 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 please. Oh, Hydreigon. All right, look, we take that. We were down to five Pokemon, but we got really lucky with our Caesar and Hydreigon evolutions. But the champion was going to have a full team of powerful Pokemon. This would be the final hurdle of the challenge, a battle with the champion, Diantha. I was praying for a lead that I could set up Toxic Spikes against, and Diantha spat in my face. She led with Frostlass, which is terrible for Meganium. So my plan was to switch into Caesar. I can tank its blizzards pretty well while also setting up a Leech Seed. But once Frostlass's HP gets low, it starts using Destiny Bond, which is really scary. To counter this, I need to make sure that Frostlass dies to Leech Seed rather than a direct attack. Once Frostlass runs out of Blizzard PP though, I can safely switch into Meganium just as Frostlass falls. This gives me another chance to set up Toxic Spikes, but Diantha sends in a Howlucha next and this thing is scary. With Swords Dance and powerful attacks in its arsenal, it has plenty of sweeping potential. But since this is the final battle, I decided that setting up Toxic Spikes is my main priority. This ends up working pretty well, although Howlucha does manage to boost its attack to plus two in the process. I need to take out this Howlucha, so bring Caesar back in and and set up Leech Seed. But the situation looks bad as Howlucha is now at plus four and it was about to get worse. Oh, thank God. All right, we landed Leech Seed. That's big. This Howlucha is so scary. It is so scary. Does it outspeed Hydreigon? Uh, probably, probably. Yeah. All right, we just connected Leech Seed. High jump kick. How much does that do? Oh, there goes Raymond. There goes Raymond. We lost our bulkiest Pokemon, but this does let me bring Alakazam in and finally remove Halucha with a Psychic. It was down to a 4v4, and Diantha's next Pokemon was Dewblade. I expected it to go for Night Slash on this turn, so bring Hydreigon in. It ended up using Power Trick, which is totally fine, and on the next turn, an Earth Power takes it down. Next up is Slurpuff, and I really don't have any great Fairy-type counters, so I switch into our bulky Meganium, who can finish it off with a few Earthquakes plus some Toxic Damage. And then Diantha sent out this. A Mew? Okay. 
What does Mew have? Mew buffed its defenses, and I was able to get it low. However, Diantha used a full restore, which cures the poison, so I can't rely on toxic damage to take it down. This Mew only has two damaging moves, Psychic and Ancient Power, so I forged a new plan. If I can drain the Ancient Power PP, then Mew won't have anything that can damage my Dark-type Hydreigon. This should be pretty safe, as long as Mew doesn't hit the 10% chance for an Omni Boost. All right, all we need is no Omni Boost. No Ancient Power Omni Boost, please. Oh, that's doing so little. And then Barrier as well. How are we going to kill this thing? No Omni Boost, please. Oh my god, it's all going wrong. Even though I was able to paralyze Mew with Dragon Breath, its synchronized ability means that I'm paralyzed too. I needed some luck and simply spammed Roost while hoping for no more Omni Boosts. But once Mew is out of Ancient Power, the KO is guaranteed. It just takes a really, really long time. Once Mew eventually goes down, Diantha sends out her final Pokemon, another Slurpuff. And there was only one Pokemon for the job. Come on, Chatot, it's your time. Believe! Chatot's about to do its ultimate move. The ultimate Chatot combination. Double team! Now there's two Chatots. All right, now Chatot does its final move. Earthquake. Chatot, finish it off. You've fallen right into Chatot's trap. Boom, there it is. Ha <laughs> ha! Huge! Believe in the bird! There it is, Diantha taken down. Chatot is the MVP. With that, I'd beaten the challenge. For more Pokemon content, jump into this video next. Like and subscribe for more Chatot content, and I'll see you in the next one.